chapter. Uh, sure. Brothers and sisters, uh, hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Anybody out there? Good afternoon. All right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Hey. Yes. Um, I want to thank your leadership, uh, your party, yourselves for the opportunity to um, visit with you uh, at one of the most extraordinary moments, certainly in my life and perhaps in many of our lives. Um, my first visit to Canada was in 1968, uh, 40 years ago when I came with my colleague Jessica Govea and a Franciscan priest, Mark Day, on behalf of the California farm workers to establish a grape boycott in the third and fifth largest grape markets in North America, which were Toronto and Montreal. One of the first places that we were welcomed and invited to speak was the Provincial Council of the NDP. And um, when then, where, where then leader uh, Donald McDonald um, and others welcomed us as brothers and sisters in a common struggle. And we were a little confused about Donald McDonald because there was another Donald McDonald who was the CLC Donald McDonald. And we thought everybody in Canada was Donald McDonald for a little while. We had to, we had to learn. Uh, it was, for us, a great opportunity to learn. Uh, we learned from the way in which you were organized. We learned from the way in which you did union work. And the solidarity of Canadian citizens, workers across the country was one of the critical factors that won the great boycott and won union rights for California farm workers. And so even though it's many years ago, I want to thank you for that right now again. I, I also had the, op, the, the, the privilege, although the outcome wasn't what we'd hoped for, uh, to walk uh, precincts in York South riding for David Lewis's last election uh, to Parliament. And um, so, anyway, uh, there's a history. But there was always one big problem uh, that time, and it seems almost any, every other time that I've, I've come to Canada. Uh, I've always had to apologize for somebody we just elected president. <laughs> well, it took us 40 years, but I think we finally got it right. I think we finally got it right. And I say 40 years because 1968, when our response to the challenges of civil rights and the freedom movements of the 1960s was to elect Richard Nixon, I think sent our country on, uh, off the track for many, many years. Uh, and I guess we just concluded that, that wandering in the desert for 40 years is just about long enough uh, and that it may be time to cross the river and that's what we're hoping to do. But it's a little hard to get used to. Uh, progressives in the United States um, are very familiar with the politics of disappointment. Um, you know, uh, you know, you're disappointed. So um, you, uh, your critical skills get very well developed, and so you sort of have a distant early warning system for detecting the first signs that you're going to be let down, that you're going to be disappointed, that it isn't going to be what you hoped it would be. And boy, we are really good at that. I don't know about you all, but we are. The politics of hope is a lot more challenging because in the politics of hope you have to take responsibility for identifying the opportunities and seize those opportunities to make the most of them and that takes courage and it takes imagination and what we found was that our critical facility at planet, our imaginative one and now we have to be more imaginative but we're happy to have the opportunity to do so. It's a powerful moment because um, it's both the best of times and the worst of times. It's what theologian Walter Brueggemann calls a prophetic moment, when there's a convergence of what he calls criticality, a clear eye, a clear understanding of the world's pain, suffering, sorrow, and limitations, but coupled with, coupled with hope a capacity to see the world's joys, its possibilities, and its opportunities. And it's the two coming together 
that make this such a powerfully transformational moment in our country and hopefully in yours as well. But you know, they don't last forever. And um, Tom Hayden, my old friend Tom Hayden, used to say, change is slow except when it's fast. <laughs> and we're in a fast moment right now, and so what we do really matters. It's also nice that one of my students came up to me and finally said, well, this is the first time that community organizing looks like a better job prospect than investment banking. So I was very, I was very glad for that. So, so how do I happen to be here today? Um, and, and 40 years was a long time ago. We're not boycotting grapes anymore. Uh, but I think that I've been blessed to have a chance to have two bites out of the apple. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the second bite. I know apples and grapes are a little confusing, but uh, I'd grown up in Bakersfield, California, which is an uh, oil and agriculture town, southern end of the San Joaquin Valley, where my father was a rabbi, my mother a teacher, and I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to go to Harvard in 1960. And 1960 was an amazing time to come there. I had never encountered elitism like that before. On the other hand, Jack Kennedy had just been elected president, and 10% of our faculty went to Washington to work in his administration. So it was this combination of, of challenge uh, and, and opportunity. For me, it led to involvement with the civil rights movement, because that's what was happening all around us. And I think I got involved in civil rights work at that time because, well, for three reasons. First, uh, we lived in Germany for three years after the Second World War, when my father was a chaplain in the American Army. Most of his work was with Holocaust survivors. And as a child, I met people, individual men and women, who had survived this horror and who were on their way to find some hope somewhere. My parents were very clear. They interpreted the Holocaust to me not as so much, not simply a consequence of anti Semitism, but of racism, and that racism kills. Very simple. And that's what the civil rights movement was challenging. But secondly,